name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to learn your word, to study your presence in our lives, and to know that you do care about us always. And we ask that you bless us and open our hearts to your word tonight. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, there was a couple of questions that I'd like to answer <coughs> because yes, I got some email. And I know sometimes people are, you know, let's say hesitant to, to ask questions, especially, you know, in the front of the public. So one of the questions was, God's intention was to create a being in his own image. Why? Well, the question is very simple, because God loves to share who he is. And God's want, God wanted to have, in a way, partners in the relationship. Because again, God can, you know, being a trinity, God can, let's say, self-sufficient, but God, you know, this outpouring of God's love is, uh, God wants to pour out and share himself and that love with everybody else. That's why he is a being that are basically he's almost equal, because we have the same capacity as God does, you know, we have free will, something that we know we can work with God, but we can reject him. That's what happened, okay? Uh, Okay, why God does why God why does God want to give humanity the chance to bring blessing into the world? He is God. He doesn't need humanity to do that. Okay, well, good question. Why God wants you know give us chance to bring His blessings to the world? Because again, because He put us in charge, and by us, in a way, making bringing creation closer to God, we make the whole world and ourselves better. So that's, that's what this whole idea about, you know, being God's blessing for the creation and bringing the whole of creation back to God. So that's, that's more or less uh, what is there. The other one is floods, winds, why is it happening now? Okay, good question after Ayan, right? Well, that's the way God created the world. We have to remember that <clears throat> all those like hurricanes and all the other natural disasters, they don't have moral evil in them. They bad as such, because that's how creation works. But they are not morally bad. Like humans do moral evil, moral, you know, we, we could do things bad, you know, bad things because, you know, ethic, ethically we are, you know, inclined towards evil. The hurricane is just, you know, let's say thing of nature. That's how it happens, winds and floods. And unfortunately, sometimes we're in the midst of it. So that's how it works. You know, why God created the world that way? I have no answer to that. <laughs> Just because, right? Sometimes like your mother, your mother told you, just because. God created rebellion, Cain and Abel, okay, we're gonna talk about that. Okay, that's basically it. And then one more time, because that was a question that I, I missed a little bit because I was tired last week a little bit. I got a long day that day about uh, why God, uh, let's say, put the tree of good and e knowledge of good and evil in, into the garden. Well, the basic thing is because God wants us to make, to have choice, okay? God put that tree so that we could have a moral choice, an ethical choice, that we have choice between life of innocence and the knowledge and death. And isn't that the way we live as humans? Remember, a lot of things in the, this account are descriptive, not prescriptive, meaning they describe reality as people see it. They don't say, oh, this is how things should be working, or this is how, thing, how God wanted things to work. No. They describe things as they see it, and they say, this is the reality that we encounter. That's what God created. Okay, why? Just because. Right? Sometimes that's, that's the only answer. Again, if we knew answers to a lot of all those questions, we would be God. Okay? But we are not. So, can you hear me in the back over there? Okay. Still with this one? Okay, last week was, you can probably come closer. I think we'll be, we'll be. <laughs> I know we finished on the chapter, okay, of, on women and if they like strong men. I know there was a little uh, stir up here in the front, yes, yes. Again, just remember, this is a description of reality. Not the way God intended, but it's a, and again, it's an effect of sin, but it's a description of reality. Because we know that's, that's our human nature that mostly let's say when people are getting married, and that's proven by experience and by research and all that, usually women, 
they will f look for a partner who, who earns at least as much as she does or more, never someone who earns less. Okay? Women, no matter how tall they are, they always look for a man who is taller than them, not shorter. So there is something about that, this whole thing that women, you know, are attracted into, I would say, uh, not, dominate, not, not dominant, because that's not, not a good word, but women are attracted to men, not to boys, put it that way, okay? Because if man is not grown up and it's not successful, he's not, you know, knows what he's after, then, you know, unless a woman, woman wants to take care of that boy for the rest of her life, usually women don't pick up boys. And if they do, it doesn't, uh, doesn't, let's say, end up too well, you know. So that's, that's basically just the description of reality. Would that work? No, we're still equal. We st you say, no, no, they say we're still equal, we just don't live that way because of the sin. No, but remember, because of the free will, people, have, people make the choice for themselves, okay? For not, not to listen to God. And the same thing with that. You know, you can make choice to, let's say, let's say any, anybody can make that choice that to marry to a partner that is equal and try to live that life. And that's, that's the healthiest way and the norm, normal way. But a lot of people don't do that. And why? Because it's an effect of sin. Because of our sinfulness. So that's, why, that's what they're saying. Because of our disobedience, because of us being selfish, you know, because you know, sin is basically to choosing myself over God and others. Okay? So because of that, that's what the, all the nonsense in the world is happening. Okay? So again, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay? Does it work? <laughs> we can discuss that, but I think that's, that's the only way to, to, you know, to, to, to kind of uh, work through that. <laughs> All right, so we have, uh, so we finish verse, uh, chapter, chapter three, actually, we did, okay? We start at four, right? Yeah. So you see, again, again, God kicks Adam and Eve out of garden and puts the cherub and the fiery sword to guard so that they, walk, they don't walk back. That's, that's a simple, that's the end of chapter three. Chapter four. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and born Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. This is interesting because, you know, remember from what kind of tree they ate, of knowledge of good and evil. Here, the sexual act is, is called to know someone. And the entire Bible uses that euphemism, that, you know, man knows a woman, and she usually, you know, has a child because of that knowledge. So there is some kind of, you know, I think the also description of reality that sex help us to get to know each other on a much deeper level, a different level. That's why church is teaching that sex is so, let's say, important and uh, also in, in marriage is, it has to be lived in the right way. Why? Because it, let's say, implies and it brings the deeper knowledge. So if we just start sleeping around with people, you know, this is all, what's happening there, you know, there is this element of being one with, with that person, being faithful one and knowing someone, you know, it's only to, the, it's reduced to the, to the level of lust, nothing else, which is, you know, unfortunate. But that's why church is teaching that you know, sex is not the, the only thing, but it's very important in a relationship between man and woman, okay? So that's why when we do preparation for marriage, what is happening, usually it's like six months to a year, when you try to help people to know each other without being genital. Okay? It's okay, so they need to know how to be intimate without being physical, without that. That's the preparation. That's why church tells us, you know, no sex before marriage. Why? Because you need to learn how to be intimate, how to know each other before you know each other all the way through. Okay? So this is this, this all biblical you know, basis for that. It's not that we make it up, because it says, you know, we... Men should leave his family and, you know, go after a woman. They should become one, and that's it. There is no changing of that. Okay, so he knows him, and she born Cain, saying... The, just the names, just to tell you about those names. 
because it's very important here when, when you look at the names in Hebrew. So Cain means basically, uh, what is my notes? So Cain means, means to create, one meaning. There's another meaning in Hebrew that, that is uh, a smith, a metal worker as well. We'll see that later on. But the, one of the meanings is, uh, is to create. So Eve is recognizing that with God's blessing, she is creating a new human life. So that's why she names Cain, Cain, because that's, that's his name. So, and then Abel, Abel in Hebrew means vapor, like the human breath, like you know, the, <clears throat> when you see it in, in, in the humidity or in the cold, you know, something that comes out, you can see it, but then it disappears very quickly. The Book of Kohelet has vanity and, and vanity and everything is vanity. That's, that's the word Abel in Hebrew. So it, it's also a very appropriate name because Ab, Ab, uh, Abel is coming only for like a couple of verses and then he disappears. So those, those, uh, let's say those names have very symbolic meaning that also kind of tell us you know, what, what is going to happen in this story. And also when we look at that, the word brother in this account, the word brother in this account is repeated seven times. Okay? That's, that's also very important because of the last questions in the account. So let's read the account and then we'll see. Verse 2, and again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of this ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought some of the firstling of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had, reg had regarded for Abel and his offerings, but for Cain and his offerings he had no regard, no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Actually, the word in Hebrew is not very angry, he was very sad. So Cain goes into depression almost because he sees that God rejects his gifts. A couple of things here. Some scripture scholars will tell that this account describes the tension between nomadic people, which are the, the Hebrews, which are the Israelites, before they settled in Canaan, and people of Canaan who were farmers. So we have this, you know, this tension always between the uh, people who have their animals, who herd their animals, and farmers. They always run into trouble. Some people will say, some scholars will say, oh, this describes this reality of fight between farmers and uh, shepherds. Yeah, maybe. What is more important here, it's the first human activity is farming and husbandry, animal husbandry. So both things that build civilization. Why? Because farming, you know, gives us food. And the, the rabbi will said, before people ate meat, you know, the animals were, were provi did provide people with milk and wool and all the, all the other stuff. But they didn't, at that time, they did not eat them. So what is happening here? They bring the gifts to, to the Lord. So they both know, so from the very beginning, this is recognition of human gratitude that we, need, that we need to recognize and be grateful to God. That's why we give him the gifts, right? We give him gifts. So that's, that's, the, that's you know, this level of gratitude here. Why was uh, Cain offering rejected and Abel was accepted? Well, my best explanation is God was not in mood for veggies that day, okay? Because Cain brought products of earth, you know, grain and veggies. Abel brought sheep. God was not in mood for veggies that day, as simple as it is, you know? But the deeper, deeper level, I think it's intention in, in worship. And I think that's something that we all need to look at because it do apply, does apply to us. You know, how we come before God? Do we do things out of the, let's say, out of love, out of gratitude? You know, do we worship God out of you know, desire to be one with him? Or we do, do it just because we have to and it's for show? So intentions are very important. Usually when you look at the Bible, people's intentions are not really that important, the actions are. In this account, intentions are very important because they apply to religion. And later on, we'll see that in prophets and other you know, writings. It's always, people said, it's not what you, what you do, it's what your intentions are. That's why Jesus is talking about Pharisee and uh, you know, publican praying in the, in, the, in the temple. And they're both praying, right? But one is saying, look how good I am, and the other one saying, poor me. 
know, and who is justified? The one who recognized his, you know, who didn't you know, kind of brag about himself, but the one who, whose attitude, whose intentions were right. So this is, you know, part of our thing, you know, how do we approach God? Okay, that's from the very beginning was important. And here the response of Abel, which is very inappropriate, and that's what God is telling right now. Because again, he's, yeah, he was distressed. So the Cain mood was depression, not anger. This uh, translation about that is angry, it's the wrong one. That I don't know why they keep that. But So what's happening there? Verse 6. And the Lord, and the Lord said to Cain, why are you distressed, and why is your face fallen? Surely, if you do right, there is uplift. But if you do not do right, sin crouches at the door. It's urge it's toward you, yet you can be its master. So the beautiful couple of verses that they're saying, look, why are you distressed? What, was the, the, what should be the right response of, Abel, of Cain to Abel's sacrifice being offered? Well, you should say, He's much, he does, does things much better, and he's, uh, let's say, a better person. I want to be like him. Instead, he becomes distressed. He becomes jealous. And that's our human nature. Very often we have people who are successful around us. You know, or we see that in politics right now, right? You know, take our, you know, tax the rich and all the other things. So what are we going to do? We don't want to become better and more successful like them. We want to pull them down. We want to, you know, punish them for their success. That, that's our human approach to things. That's how we approach. So here, the, and God is telling him, why are you distressed? You should, you should be, do things differently. And, he, and it's this beautiful, beautiful image about sin crouching at your door. You can see that that sin is kind of like waiting for, a, you know, for Cain to come out and just jump on him. But, and it, but it ends up, but you still can master that sin. You, you still can master that temptation. So this is basically to say that we are not predetermined by our moods and by what things are ha how things are happening to us, we have mastery of, of who we are. And this is, you know, applies to, to humans very, it's very important because, again, it comes from this whole idea, just to ask, you know, do you believe that humans are born good? That humans are good, basically, yes? Right? That's not the Bible. The Bible says we are basically broken, we are, we are bad. Because from the very beginning, our inclinations are towards selfishness and evil. You know, did you have, how many times did you have to say, you one year old, two years old, don't touch it, you know, say, say thank you, all things like that. You see, the whole idea is we are being, again, we're being broken, we're being born, we are born with, again, the stain of original sin. Our natural inclination is towards selfishness and evil because that's what it implies, you know, we choose others, uh, we choose ourselves over God and others. So that's, that's the thing usually ends up, doesn't that end up well. So that we need to be taught how to be good, right? That's what you, need, what you teach your children, how to be good, how to, be, how to say thank you, how to be grateful and all the other things. What's happened, you know, since, actually since we saw, since enlightenment, that, you know, this whole idea that people, oh no, people are born good, then society corrupts them. That's basically what is the uh, most, uh, let's say, prevalent uh, ideas right now in the world, right? It's all society's fault, because they assigned gender or they you know, did other things. People are good, they know what they, what they want. That, so what is happening when society believes when, that people are not are, are being born good? Well, you don't have to teach children how to be good. And people don't, why? Why teach some, some, you know, to children something that is natural to them? If they are naturally good, you don't have to teach them how to be good. The Bible is telling us, telling us, no, that is not how it works. You have to teach children how to be good from the very beginning, because they don't know. If you let them run you know, by themselves, it's going to be a disaster. There's a good book and movie for that, the, the, the Lord of the Flies. Have you ever heard about that movie and book? This group of boys that is being uh, stranded on the island that nobody lives on, and they, you know, they are innocent because they all like between eight and thirteen or something like that. And you know, you would think that at the beginning of, the, of this of, the, of them being stranded on that island, everything is peachy and rosy and nice, and then hell starts. 
because they are so cruel to each other and there's, there's killing and all the other things. So they know the author of that book is just basically is telling us that our nature is not good. As humans, we have tendency to evil, and if we have an op opportunity to harm another human being without punishment, we will do it, only because we can. That's who we are. So we need to be educated, we need to be formed, we need to be taught how to be good. Even for yourself, you know what is good? How often you follow that? Hopefully 90% of the time. Or maybe, maybe you know, more than that, but you see, that's the whole thing. We know what is good, but we still choose what is Let's say, well, let's say instant gratification, put it that way, rather than sin. Okay? That's what we choose, rather than good for its sake. So here, basically, again, this whole idea of, you know, what the Bible is teaching from the very beginning says, look, we're not good. Because of the sin, we're not good. We sin the same way Adam and Eve did. We disobedient, we choose ourselves, and we choose instant gratification. And we need to be taught to do things differently. That's why in the history of salvation, we have you know, three times that God intervenes to teach us that. The first time would be the covenant with Noah. The second time would be covenant with Moses and people of Israel. And the third time would be our Lord, Jesus. See, each time God is teaching us something more about ourselves, about hu our human nature, and also how to, let's say, live our lives, you know, how to be a good person. What does it mean to, to be a good person? There's a set of laws, set of rules. There are consequences to, you know, you know, crossing them, but there's, in the end there is just because there, in the end there is justice, but also God is merciful. So, God is in a way in this Bible we see that gradually God is trying to teach us that, but that's why it's so important to teach children how to be good. You know, most of the parents yeah, I work with with kids, so most of the parents want their kids to be happy and successful, right? Good, that's a good thing. The problem is, you know you should be concerned about how good your child is. Because they're not going to be happy if they are not good. They will be successful if they are not good, yeah, they can, do, they can do that. But if they are not good person, they will never be happy and they will never be li live life that will be satisfying even to, your par to, to the parents. So it's very important to teach your children how to be good and grandchildren, see. And that comes from, again, they are rules, they are consequences, and there is a God who is above humans who you know, tells us what does it mean to be good. Because when you look at different societies, they will have different, uh, let's say, approaches to what is good, what is bad, right? You know, you go, I don't know, where was it? I heard it somewhere. Some people said, you know, there are some societies that, uh, let's say, consider stealing from others the, the good thing, as long as you don't get caught, right? Well, we know that taking things from others is not good, that taking human life is not good, and that's that what happened here. So let's continue on that. We good so far? Okay. So he tells him, again, the sin crouches at the door, but you can be its master. So we can, and again, we are not predetermined by our urges. So Cain said to his, to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain set upon his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Then he said, what have you done? Hark, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Therefore, you shall be more cursed from the ground, which open its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. If you till the soil, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall become a ceaseless wanderer on earth. <clears throat> so great thing. I know in verse 8 you have this, because this translation is Cain said to his brother Abel, and there is, and when they were in the field, and you have in your translation, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go into the field. See, in Hebrew, there is that part, let's go into the field, is not there. That was added later. In Hebrew is this jump that Cain said, said to his brother Abel, so they were talking, and then when they were in the field, he set upon his brother and killed him. So just, just to, to know why I read that. So this whole idea is now the dialogue between Cain and God. Where is your brother Abel? It's almost the same exactly question that God is asking Adam when he said, where are you? Right, the first question, here's this, where is your brother? And Cain said, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? There's two possible, let's say, translation approaches to this, to this answer. 
The first one is, I don't know and I don't care. See, that's one thing. The second one is what Adam did. That's why it's, it's possible as well, you know, in Hebrew. What Adam did. When Adam was talking to God, you know, the woman whom you gave to me, right? So here in a way, Adam, Cain is telling to God, no, I don't know, you are, you should know, you are the one who is his keeper. And at the same time, the word brother is in this account repeated seven times, which means the author is trying to tell us that we are our brother's keepers. Okay, because seven is perfection. So the able and brother is repeated seven times. So it's important for us to know that, again, we are our brother's keepers. So we are responsible for each other. Very often we forget that. We only think about ourselves, not about what other people are doing. But we are responsible for each other. So, okay, and then the, the, the punishment comes kind of interesting because you should be no longer toil soil, you should become a ceaseless wanderer on earth. Someone who wanders without, you know, someone who had no rest. Again, the this, this sin of Abel wasn't, you know, again, he didn't kill Cain. Cain did not kill his brother with, as a, it wasn't a premeditated murder. It was more a crime of passion. Why? Because he was so down, so depressed, that he just blew up. So it's not like, like a premeditated murder. So, but yet God is telling him that you're not gonna, because of what you have done, you're not gonna find peace on earth. You're never gonna find peace. And then Cain said to the Lord, verse 13, he says, my punishment is too great to bear. In Hebrew, also the word could be translated as, my sin is too great to bear. So it's both, it's our sin, our punishment? Well, it could be. He has to walk for the rest of his life with this, uh, let's say, realization with his knowledge that he has killed his brother. That's why he's ceaseless wanderer. Like he will never find peace. And this is too much for him. So that's why he's saying. The one, one more thing is here, it's, you know, sometimes when you look at verse 10, God says, what have you done? So it's not a judgment. God is saying like, what have you done? It's like cry of you know, anguish. Like, why did you do that? See, that's, that's that thing. So it's not a judgment. That God is not judging. God is just almost like despairing. Now, why did you kill him? But the punishment will be, again, to walk around with this, with his conscience, you know, the sin of killing his brother on his conscience. And, it, and what, you know, what is interesting, because as of till now, you have only four people on earth, right? So nobody killed anybody, and nobody says that killing was wrong. Right? Up till now, we wouldn't know that killing was wrong. All of a sudden, we do. There is something in us, in human being, and in every single culture on earth, that we know that killing is wrong. Sometimes people will justify killing, but in general, killing is wrong and it's always treated as such. So there is something in us that tells us that killing another human being, murdering, sorry, I'm talking about murdering someone, but we're talking about murder. Killing, you know, there's a justified killing in self-defense, there is just war and all the other things. But murdering something is really a great sin. That's what this, this account is telling us. So, again, we can talk about uh, just, uh, let's say, what, is, what, what would be that punishment, right? C capital punishment. You know, are we, you know, should we have capital punishment or not? I think we would discuss that once before. But the thing is, some people do deserve to die for what have have done because they not, there is no regret in some people. And you see that also, yeah, today, the, the, the Christmas killer, or you, the, 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 court, the Christmas killer today, he was cursing people who, the families that he was, of people that he, was, that he killed and he was, you know, you can tell that there's no remorse in that person. See, that society needs to protect itself from, let's say, from cancer, from bad things. Church is telling us, oh, well, that's, that's, killing is bad. Yeah, killing is bad. But, you know, is justice you know, to the victim and their families, is that m less important than the life of someone who did gr great harm and is not repentful? There is, no, there is no remorse in that person. So I think in some cases, again, not all, some cases, that penalty, penalty is justified. That's not position of the church. That's my private, private opinion, okay? In catechism, we'll hear that, you know, there is, you know, that, that sentence, that penalty is unjust and so on. But again, sometimes society needs to deter people from doing things. And the only, 
let's say, way, way to prevent certain behaviors is if people know that they're going to be punished for that, what they do. Right? Like, you know, it used to be here that, you know, you're a cop killer, you're going on the electric chair, period. Now things have changed, so what's happening? The cops are being killed all over the place, right? Because there is no deterrence, you know, there's, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go, go to prison, maybe because some DA will send me free and I don't want to go back to court. So, see, there is this, this whole idea about justice. Justice needs to be rendered. You can be merciful once you're just. The Parkland shooter, the, the trial ended up today, right? What is happening? You know, this whole justice was rendered. Okay, he is sentenced to life in prison. You know, they were demanding death penalty. I don't think he deserved death penalty because of his mental state. But at least society needs to protect itself from people like that. You know, there was a lot of mistakes done with, with that poor guy. You know, I was there. So, you know, but justice was served. That's why when the governor says, you know, okay, well, you deserve to die. Of course he deserves to die. But he mentally does not, is not there. You know, that's, so better punishment for him would be to spend his life in, life in prison. But there are other cases that are not. So, again... Taking human life sometimes could be justified. Again, self-defense. You know, that, that's the one case that for sure you, you're going to be justified with that. But in general, murdering someone is never, the Bible never approves that and it always says, murdering, murder is a murder. That's why, and the abortion. What's happening with the abortions, right? It's my choice, my body, my choice. No, you murdering a child, as simple as it is. <coughs> So what has, it has to be some, uh, let's say, justice for that in consequences, but it also has to be some protection of those who cannot defend them, themselves. So you say, we can discuss that over and over again, but I think the main thing is to murdering, to killing innocent, to murdering someone who, with premeditation and all that, that should be punished the same way. Why? Because if you take life, you deserve, you know, your life is forfeited, you forfeit your life. So we can just, so I don't know if we agree or not, but let's not discuss it now. Let's go, let's move in. So we are, okay. So Cain left the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Kind of interesting because Nod in Hebrew means wandering. So he sends, he sets up in the land of wandering, east of Eden. That's interesting. So then Cain, verse 17, Cain knew his wife again knowing the woman, and she conceived and bore Enosh. And he then founded a city and named the city after his son Enosh. So there's a little contradiction here, don't you think? He was supposed to be wandering the earth and never find rest, and all of a sudden he, he you know, builds a city. Again, he cannot set up as a farmer, but he builds a city, he founds a city, and he probably is more restless in the city than anybody else because, no, if you live in the big city, you are a little like restless, aren't you? You know, I live in New York, I lived in Washington and Cairo and a couple other big cities. Miami, oh, right now we don't live like in the city, but imagine living in, like in Brickell or downtown Miami. Those people are restless all the time. So it could be the punishment of, of Cain that he, was, he has to live in the city because of, you know, that's the place when you never rest, never sleep. There's always something going on. So the Cain is going on and then Enosh and Enosh, to Enosh was born Irad, and Irad begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methuselah, and Methuselah begot Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives, the one of Abda, the other one was Zila, Abda Borjabal, and so on and so forth and so forth. We have all those names, and we have, uh, coming to verse 23, Lamech, who says, Adan and Zila hear my voice, O wives of Lamech, give ear to my speech. I have slain a man for wounding me and a lad for bruising me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So we see this progressive, uh, let's say, cruelty and sin going on earth. But what is happening here? Well, when you see there is only seven generations on, of Cain mentioned. After that, the Bible never mentioned him again. He disappears. Because again, there's a point that to say that humanity descend from the Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. So we are not descendants of Cain, we are not descendants of a murderer, okay? That's, the, that's the one message. The second one is, uh, let's say when it, I thought it was the very end, when Lamech is saying, okay, 
if Cain was avenged seven times, I'm avenged 77 times. So is this you know, perfection of violence, right? Does those numbers sound familiar, this passage, especially this verse? When Peter comes to Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and Matthew, and he tells him, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus' response is, 77 times. See, this is the, the, by how the Bible uses itself with that. So Jesus and Peter are playing the same game as Lamech. So Peter, Peter says, well, should I be like, just like, you know, Cain, you know, in, in vengeance, in forgiveness? Jesus said, no, you should be so crazy with forgiveness that you should always forgive. Okay, so this is 7 and 77. So it's good to look at that. So Luke 17, 3 to 4 and Matthew 18. You can 70 times 7. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth, meaning God has provided me with another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain has killed him. And to Seth in return, a son was born, and he named him Enosh. And that was when men began to invoke the Lord's by name. There's a couple of interesting things here. Seth means, uh, okay, we have five minutes? Five minutes, okay. Set means basically to a foundation, could mean foundation in Hebrew. So basically, Set, the third son, is the foundation of the humanity. And his son, Enosh, again, remember going back to the Hebrew name for man, Ish, Enosh means a weak man. So the second foundation of humanity creates man, not only man, but man who is weak. Why is weak? Because from this moment on, we'll see this whole escalation of violence and evil and uh, all the bad things that are happening. And, but it's, what is also, it says, it was then that men began to invoke the Lord by name. Knowledge of God is not, let's say, exclusive to the Hebrew to Israelites. And from the very beginning, people were called, people, Bible saying, people knew that there's only one God. And God was known to humanity by name. Only later on, they wander away from that. So there is something in human nature, it is in us, that we know that there is this spiritual being, that there is this spiritual reality that is transcendent, that is bigger than us, and it's in our hearts. Each and every human being knows that. Yeah. Okay, let's take a break. Two minutes, thank you. <coughs> now, as we begin, the question was, where did Cain wife came from? There's only three of them, or four people on earth, right? Uh, Bible is not really interested in that. So they don't give us every single person that was born. You know, probably Cain, if you, if you read, you know, the thing, okay, so if everybody com comes from Adam and Eve, she probably was his sister that is not mentioned being born. Yeah, it's like certain questions just don't ask, you know. That's, because we, we just don't know. The Bible is, doesn't say, and uh, nowhere in the Bible you will find an answer to that. Where those other people came from? From Adam and Eve. Okay? I don't know. No, that's a good, good question, but there's, there's no real answer to that because we, we just don't know, and the Bible does not give us an answer to that. We just assume, again, it's like, uh, let's say, when, when, when we talk about the science and we talk about Lucy, right? when you know, the natural sciences will tell us that we all descendants of this one, uh, let's say, monkey that came down from tree and became human, you know, that they give her name Lucy, okay? Uh, Lucy, female, doesn't, where are the other you know, males and children, where they come from? The whole thing is, we are all children of Adam and Eve, we are all equal in dignity, because, and we are all image and likeness of God. That's what counts. Bible not interested in those minutiae kind of try to explain everything. Sometimes you know, <clears throat> things are being left out on purpose so that we will ask questions and never find answers because we don't have to know everything. That's what God is telling us. We want to know everything. Knowledge of good and evil, right? We want to know everything. God is telling us, you do not need to know everything. I know it's not a good enough answer, but that's the only one I have. Okay. <laughs> Any other answers about them? Okay. So now we have Cain and okay. 
So we finished chapter four, right? The Enosh, the weak man. So now we go to chapter five. Now chapter five is interesting because you have, we're not gonna, we're not gonna read through all of that. I'm just gonna talk about this whole genealogies. What is important here, genealogies? Okay, why those people live so long? Right, 600 years, 700 years, Matuzalek reads 960 day, uh, years, he's the longest one. There is two answers to that, maybe three. One is maybe just they just live that long, but what this genealogy provides, it provides a proof that as the evil progresses, the life get, is getting shorter. When you, when you look at those names, it goes up and then it goes down, down, down. Because, you know, Matuzalek is 960, you go back to Noah, it's only 600. So you see, it's, all, it's the whole idea of Bible that as evil progresses, as they you know humans are becoming more and more corrupted, uh, the life expectancy you know, beco becoming, is becoming shorter. I don't know how it works nowadays, but it's a good idea to think about that. You know, that's, you know when, when we live <clears throat> our lives in a wrong way, Right? The sin is going to catch up to us eventually, and our lives probably will be shorter. The other thing, Bible, most of the numbers in the Bible are symbolic. So maybe the author just want to tell us something about those, na about those people. You know, that's why he uses those numbers, which are rather symbolic. Because, for example, Enosh, who is walking with God, he lives 365 years. Does that sound so familiar? He walks with God, and God takes, takes him to himself after 265 years, which is a year, a solar year. So what, what the author is telling us that, you know, that Enosh is lived this, his whole, the fullness of his life, and God took him to himself. He's, Enosh is the only one, not other than Elijah, that in the Bible it says that he not, is, did not die. God took him to himself the same way God took Elijah to himself. So, are those numbers symbolic? Maybe. We just don't know the symbolism. Because people are trying to figure out, you know, and there's a Jewish way of uh, reading the Bible, which they call Kabbalah, because each Hebrew letter has a numeric value. So they try to put the numbers, uh, let's say, the letters to those numbers. Things don't work. Again, we don't have to know everything. What, God, what the, the author wants us to, to know, that no matter how long our life is, if we only, if we live in sin, we're going to make the, this world a wo worse place. Okay. Because that's what basically, that's why God is punishing. We have seven, we have ten generations right now, because those are ten generations mentioned. So between Adam and Noah, there is ten generations. Okay, remember, this is a symbol, symbolic thing. God creates the world with ten words. God creates the holy, you know, people of Israel with 10 words or 10 statements, what is happening here? You know, God, in a way, creates this purified world in 10 generations. Because Noah is the 10th generation after Adam. So he is the one who, in whose lifetime there will be a new, in a way, new creation. Because the whole earth will be purified and basically made anew. So you have 10 generations. And then we have, between Noah and Abraham, when you read to chapter 11, there is also 10 generations. So God is preparing. After Noah, this new creation, there is 10 generations to beginning of creation of the Hebrew people. And the next time we hear about 10, it will be 10 plagues in Egypt and 10 uh, commandments. So you see, that's why you have to pay attention to the numbers in the Bible, because it tells us you know, what the author is trying to tell us, but also it tells us you know, how God works. That's what he's trying to tell us. But he says, God works in an orderly way. When there is order in our lives, we know that comes from God. Not rigid, not you know, being rigid, but being ordered. Okay? Being, let's say, self-controlled, right? right? You know, that's how we create better people, but teaching people how to be better self-controlled. Because people who can control their urges and feelings better, they are better people. Because if you always blow up, and I hear that always, oh, I have a temper, I cannot control it. No, you can control it. You just choose not to, right? We all, we all do. So this whole idea about, you know, again, how God creates the world with ten words, how God 
recreates the world with 10 generations of, pe of this, those people, but prepares that, that 10 generation will be the, the, the uh, let's say, the top you know, that will save. Next 10 generations, there will be creation of the new people, of people of Israel, who will bring the ethical knowledge of God into humanity. And then we'll have Hebrew people and Ten Commandments. So those are, those are, that's the symbolism of the numbers, OK? So we talk about Enosh. Sorry, I'm in just the wrong book, OK? Verse 28 of chapter 5. Because that's, that's what, again, talking about meaning of the names. Verse 28. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he begat a son, and he named him Noah, saying, this one will provide us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands and of the very soil which God, which the Lord, placed under a course. And the name of Noah means, in Hebrew, either to rest or to comfort. So that's why I think you can understand why Noah's name is the way, because he will bring rest to the evil humanity. He will also comfort this humanity. Why? Because he will be the new beginning, so he will be the new comfort for the humanity. So the meaning of the names are important in there. So, and when Noah has lived 500 years, he begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What is happening here? Let's see. OK. Questions about the gen gen those genealogies? I don't want to go through those names because they're not really that, uh, that important. It's, it's good to, there's another thing also important here. Usually in ancient world, the only genealogies that were provided that were kept were the genealogies of kings, right, of emperors and kings. Here all of a sudden we have genealogy of a nobody. So what is Torah telling us? That we're all important. It's not only kings. Remember, they're living in a pagan world. Well, all those pagans know they can, you know, recite the genealogy of their kings up to like 30 generations. You know, that's why how we know the Egyptians, because they were, you know, the name of the kings were preserved and the years of uh, reign and all that. All of a sudden, Torah is telling us we are all important in the eyes of God. Not only kings, but even ordinary people. And God brings salvation and relief through ordinary people, not those in power, not those in charge. So that's why you don't listen to our politicians. They're not going to bring us salvation. Doesn't work like that. We're going to do it ourselves by purification. Put it that way, purifying ourselves, right? Turning back to God. Chapter 6. When men began to increase on earth and daughters were born to them, the divine beings, Ben Elohim, that's a translation, divine beings, or the son of God. I don't know which one you have. The sons of God, yeah, okay. We'll get to that. Uh, see how the beautiful they were and took wives from among them, those that pleased them. The Lord said, my breath shall not abide in man forever since, he's too he's, since he too is flesh. Let the days allowed him be 120 years. It was then, a later too, that the Nephilim appeared on earth when the divine beings cohabited with the daughters of men who bore them offsprings. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth is and how every plan devised by his mind was nothing but evil at this time. And the Lord regretted that he had made men on earth and his heart was saddened. Okay, let's look at that, this passage because I think that's very important here. So what is happening? <clears throat> ben Elohim, the son of God, so son, you know, the divine beings, uh, Remember, those people are living in the pagan society. And pagans believe that gods can come in and have sex with mortals, right? You know, know the Greek mythologies and Egyptian mythologies and Babylonian and all that. They all believe that. So they said, usually the kings, they considered the kings as semi-divine, or there were some heroes like Her Hercules, who was considered semi-divine, or Achilles in, uh, Achilles in Greek mythology. There's a lot of that. So what is, here, what is said here is more or less, uh, it's a polemic against that, because what the, what the Hebrew says, you know, this whole idea of God's intermingling with man, meaning something spiritual that all of a sudden becomes fleshy, it's an abomination to the Lord, because that does not bring anything good. 
Okay, you cannot mix those things. Meaning, you cannot make men into gods, because that brings only evil. You know, we see that in history, but well, in our own times, you know, those of you who came from Cuba, right? Fidel, wasn't he represented, you know, with Lenin and Stalin and Fidel and all those uh, things you know, everywhere, all those images as you, people were almost worshipping them, right? Weren't they gods, in a way? So you see, there's a whole idea about you know, not making humans into gods, because that mixing, you know, making human gods, that brings bad things. So that's one, one of the ideas, one of the explanations to that. Okay? There is no other clear explanation, because we just don't know what else could it be. This is the most plausible thing. That, you know, it's basically the people that you worship as semi-god or gods, they're just humans. They're not... You know, and they bring bad things, because the minute you start worshipping a human being as a god, as a semi-god, you're in trouble. And nothing good will come out of it. And we see that in our own times. So, uh, the Nephilim. Who are the Nephilim from verse... Nephilim, sorry, verse 4. Heroes of all, the, uh, the giants, and so on. Nephilim probably were the children, offspring of, that, of those mixed marriages. That's one possibility, that's one translation. The other one is that Bible is using that to talk about the giants. Because the giants in the Bible appear a couple of times, several times actually. And they all connected to the history of chosen people. The first time the giants appear, it's here. And the giants are being, you know, those heroes of old and they don't bring any good on earth. All they bring is destruction and God's punishment. Later on, the giants will appear in the book of uh, Numbers, when Moses is sending scouts to the Holy Land to check you know, how this Holy Land looks like, who are the habitants, you know, can we invade them? They come back and 10 of them said, we saw the Nephtilim, the giants living in that land. And that's what's happening there. The people of Israel get scared. They said, we will not go into land of Israel. So God says, go, okay, you're going to be working, you're going to be wandering around for 40 years. So there's been another destruction that this giants basically brought to the people. That they could not, that could, they could have entered, but because they were afraid of them, they were, the one, they were punished for 40 years in the desert. Next time we see giants, the Nephilim, the name, is when Joshua enters the Holy Land. And when he starts conquering the Holy Land, he kills all the giants. Okay? So now, giants are wiped out. What is happening? The state of Israel, right? The Israel, the kingdom of Israel is established. So this is the way. If we get rid of those, let's say, semi-gods, if we don't, you know, if we get rid of those things, we're going to create a new, let's say, reality. If we're afraid of them, you're going to be punished. You know, if, if they're in charge, they're going to bring chaos to the world. What is the last time that we hear about giants? when we hear about the last giant, the last Nephilim, when King David meets Goliath. Goliath is the last giant, Nephilim, the last Nephilim. So what's happening with that? By killing the last Nephilim, King David sets up himself on the road to succession after Saul. So this is another, you see this whole idea about getting rid of all those abominations, of all those mixture, mix, mix, mixing that should never existed, we can create, we can get something better, we can make the better world. If we are afraid of it, or if we let, let it, run it run us, you know, or rule us, we're going to be destroyed or punished. See, that's how Bible is connecting all those, all those books together. Okay? See, that's, that's, that's why we need to know Bible well so that we can make those connections, because it will make, I think it makes a little more sense when you look at, you know, the story of... Uh, Flood, the story of, uh, let's say, Exodus generation, the Joshua, and ends up with David. It's kind of a nice flow of how we deal with, again, with what Jewish consider abomination, mixing of things that should, not, should never be mixed. Okay? Does it make any sense? A little bit? Okay. <laughs> I know, sometimes I'm... But another thing here, you know, that for the first time, verse 6, God regretted that he had made man, and his heart was saddened. See, I think it's a beautiful because it describes that our God has feelings. Usually God is portrayed as, you know, God who is not, 
uh, let's say, moved by our feelings because they said, they said, no, God is spirit, perfect. God cannot have feelings. If we were created in God's image and likeness, and we do have feelings, where do they come from? Okay? Maybe that's part of being, you know, uh, God's image and likeness, that we can feel compassion, right? That we can feel sadness, that we can feel joy. Animals don't have that. We do. Okay? So it's, it's something that is, makes us human, but also it also tells us that our feelings can tell us about God. Because, you know, we're saying that when, when Jesus dies on the cross, what is happening? God is crying in heaven. God is, you know, God has broken heart. It's like here. God is saddened by all that. But the punishment that is being approached here, but is being done here, it's, it's done out of, you know, not anger. God is not angry. God is just so sad that things don't work out. Because he gave us all, those, all that freedom. Right now, people have unfettered freedom. The only thing that guides them is their own conscience, right? Nothing else. They don't have laws yet. Nothing. They just have their own conscience. It doesn't work. And that's what makes God sad. God is saying, I gave them the freedom. They know what is good, what is wrong. And they made it a mess. They destroyed. That's why the punishment for creating chaos on earth is chaos. The waters, right? Remember the beginning. The earth, the earth was tohu wabohu, right? It was uh, water, you know, the spirit was over water, and the water was like a hurricane in, in action. So that's symbol of chaos. So when we create chaos, the, the Bible is always has, has that, as sense of the punishment. Meaning we create chaos, we're going to be punished by chaos. Well, in our own lives, you know, our sinfulness. If you choose, let's say, if we choose sin, you know, which is basically to isolate ourselves. By sin, we isolate ourselves from God and from each other, right? That's sin. What is the worst punishment for our sin? Loneliness. Because if people, if we are liars, nobody will trust us. What kind of life is that when people don't trust you, for example? Right? So this is the whole idea in the Bible. As sins of the punishment. Again, it's a description of who we are as humans. That our worst sins becomes, become also our worst punishment in our own lives. So it's good to look at that, you know. That's why we have confessional, to try to straighten us up a little bit. So God is sad, and he said, I will blow out from the earth the men whom I created, men together with beasts, creeping things, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. So now you, you ask yourself, okay, why did God punish also all the animals? No, they were innocent, right? Couldn't God do something different? Well, remember, Bible is ethnocentric and theocentric, meaning human and God-centered. So, uh, Bible is telling us that the whole of creation exists only because of us. Because either it was, you know, the whole of creation exists to provide us with everything, to also, and to help us to, you know, by serving it, by guiding, go back to God. So, creation without a human, the earth without humans, does not really have a meaning. That's what the Bible is telling us, which is very different from what we are being taught in culture today, since enlightenment, but even today. You know, humans all of a sudden become, has become cancer on the, you know, on creation on earth. You know, humanity has to be controlled or limited, right? That's why we have this great reset right now go, going on. This whole idea, you know, this crazy idea is that there is too many humans on earth and they will, you know, soon we'll be starving and all those things. Uh, look at, at, at reality. Never in human history we had so many humans on earth, right? And never in the history there were people who were less poor and never hungry as, as, as they are today. You see, because of progress of technologies and human knowledge and humanity, we are able to feed those, what are we now? 10 billions? No. 8 billions? Yeah. yeah. We never had that many people. And yet, the only, way, the only time when people starve is if there, if there is a war or corruption. Like in communists, right? You know, people in North, North Korea, they are starving. And they have access to everything. So this whole idea that we are better off today than we ever were. You know, everybody, like, I would say, I don't know how many percent of humanity owns cell phone right now. Probably, I don't know, 80% of them, maybe. 
to everybody. You go to third world country, you know, I, I, live, I live in Cairo and, you know, very poor thing, but even the poorest uh, camel driver has a, has a cell phone. So everybody has a cell phone. If people don't go along hungry, they might not be filthy rich, but nobody starves unless there is corruption or war. So this whole idea that, you know, if we, we need to limit the population of the earth, you see, that's how, again, when God is taken out of picture, when God is taken out of society, that's when people start coming up with those crazy ideas. Why? Because if we are not image and likeness of God, if we are not what is the most important thing, you know, in creation, then what becomes God? Creation, earth, right? Nature. Again, we do destroy a lot of environment. I'm not saying we're not. You know, we, do, we are little, you know, monkeys that destroy things every once in a while. So the, the best thing of doing it probably will be to help us and others to not to destroy the environment and the earth, not to limit population, not to kill people, okay? So this whole idea, again, it's in this, in this case that earth without humanity has no meaning. That, that's what the Bible is telling us. The whole universe without humans has no meaning. And I think that's, that's beautiful because it kind of think about how important each and every one of us is. That without us, Earth, you know, the creation has no meaning. It's meaningless. That's why God says, I'm going to destroy it because, you know, without human, humans, it doesn't matter. Okay? But no, I was found favor with God. And then we go to the line of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his age. See, that's something that is very important for us nowadays. Noah was a righteous man. Tzaddik, as the Bible called him. So Tzaddik, just the man, could be translated uh, just man, righteous, but also innocent. You know, no, I don't think he's innocent, but he's certainly a righteous man in his generation. Meaning, in the midst of that corruption and evil that was on the earth, Noah was found the most righteous person. Does it mean that he was all good and holy? Okay, does it mean that? He was just the best from all of them. That's why I found favor with God. See, how important is that? Because, again, it teaches us that we cannot judge people who lived in the past by our standards. Because, you know, nobody before us was good enough. Nobody before us was good, period, when we look at them. That's why, you know, those toppings of the statues and all that and getting rid of all the names of, you know, founding fathers and all that, all those things because they were slave owners. Well, when you look at, at that, what's happening, you know, we judge people by our standards, of course, they were slave, of, slave owners. They were, you know, not perfect. But what, they, what, what did they create? They created the most free society ever. So how you judge people? By, no, by standards of their generation. They were good people. They were trying to do something good. They were trying to do something to improve people's lives. They did it in their own imperfect way. But we cannot judge them by our standards. <laughs> Because that way we will never learn. We will never, you know, be who we are because we will not understand our history. Now, can you judge yourself <clears throat> nowadays, what you know about yourself now, when you were a teenager? Can you judge your teenage self by what you now know about yourself? You can. Because you didn't know any better, right? You did your own things the way you thought. <laughs> but <laughs> some people make good decisions, <laughs> right? But, this, but the whole idea is, you know, that's what, what it's telling us. Noah wasn't perfect. You know, he was, he had his flaws. He was, you know, later on we see his flaws and so, so on. But he was the best person and he did everything that God wanted from him. So he did something for betterment of humanity and of the world. So again, lesson for all of us. Don't judge people living in the past by our own standards. We need to learn history, we need to know where they were, who they were, how they lived in order to make any judgment. You know, there are people that you, you know that, you know, we can, we can judge them by the standard of their times and our times, like, for example, Hitler or Stalin, right, or Fidel. You know, even at that time, everybody knew that what they, do, what they were doing <coughs> was wrong. So even by the standards of their own times, they were evil people. So we can judge that. We can, we can take that. But we cannot just say, you know, everybody who lived before us, they were bad people because they're never good enough. They created this racist, unjust society that we're living in. Well... Mother of opinion, right? 
So what God is telling to Noah? God says to, to Noah, oh, sorry, uh, Noah the righteous man, verse 11, the earth became corrupt before God. The earth was filled with lawlessness. Again, there is no justice on earth. When there is no justice, there is no reason for humanity to be around. When God saw how corrupt the earth was, for all flesh had corrupted its way on earth, God said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all flesh, for all the earth is filled with lawlessness because of them. I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood and, uh, and make it an ark with compartments and cover it inside and out with pitch. So this whole idea here, lawlessness, 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 repeated three times. Earth is filled with lawlessness. If there is no justice in human society, there is no reason for human to be alive. That's basically what the Bible is telling us. That's why later on in the Bible, the word justice, justice, justice is repeated over and over again. You know, treat each other with justice. You know, treat each other, make sure that you follow the law. Because there, there, is, no, there is no law, there is no justice. You know, society falls apart. Everybody for, for his or uh, her own. Nothing works. Right, Judge? If there is no law, everything falls apart. Yeah, that's, what, that's how it works. So, but, but again, you see this whole idea about what, what this Bible is, what Bible is trying to teach, teaching us. By lawlessness, lack of justice, bring chaos into the world. And only that way, you know, we can understand that. So what, what's happening in our country right now? The lawlessness, right? Lack of justice. People who commit crimes are letting go, are being let go, let go, and without punishment, without anything. What happened? They commit more and more crimes. See, that's, I think that's a good image of what was happening at the time of Noah. But, you know, they have probably their DAs, you know, letting people go less than right, you know, without punishing, without bail, without anything. And what's happening? Escalation of violence, escalation of injustice, escalation of lawlessness. Society is falling apart. So God is telling us, that's it. I'm done with them. It has to be purified. So hopefully God will not do that to us now, right? but we have still time to, time to repent, right? So what's happening? So God is telling Mo, uh, Noah to make an ark of gopher wood. We don't know what kind of goof, gopher wood is, or what kind of wood is that, but what is important about the ark? Those you who've been in that class before, you will know that. You know, the word ark appears in this account, guess how many times? Seven, it has to be seven. <laughs> it's, seven, it's either seven or ten. But seven is perfection, ten is always with making something new or creating something. Remember that. So the word ark appears here, tela, appears here seven times. And the, the word teva that is describing the ark appears only one more time in the Bible. And guess where it is? No. Ark of the Covenant is just a wrong translation because it should be like a box of the covenant. Because in Hebrew word for Ark of the Covenant is box. The word Teva, the word Teva appears one more time, also seven times, in the account of Moses. It's the little ark that mother's mother made out of pitch and put Moses in. It's the same word, Teva. Never again used in the Bible. Just those two times. Think about connection. What's happening with this ark? Noah against humanity is saved, right? From the waters. What happened in Moses' case? Humanity is saved to the new law, to, again, from the waters. So you see how Bible connects things by using words? So that's why we do Bible studies so that we can learn all those little trivia about the words, about translation, because we need to know that. But I think it's good to keep that connection in mind. When you talk about Mary, again, they don't use Hebrew, they use Greek, but Mary being the, the, another, the another ark, but she's ark of the covenant, but she's also the one that, you know, that brings humanity through the waters, you know, that gives birth to Jesus, right? And again, new creation, new salvation for humanity. So again, this is how you shall make it, verse 15. The length of the ark should be 300 cubits with, with, with 50 cubits and the height 30 cubits. Make an opening for daylight in the ark and terminate it with a cubit of the top. Put an entrance, make it bottom, second and third desk, deck. And so on, I will bring the flood. Okay, let's talk about, about that. What's a cubit? It's from here to here. That's cubit. 
from the top of my middle finger to the elbow. That's cubit. An average man, again, man, because men are bigger, is 18 inches. Okay? So the arcs, the arc uh, has, let's say, what they say, the dimension of the arc will be about 400 feet in length, 75 feet in width, and 45 feet in height. So basically giving displacements of about 43,000 tons. There is a model of ARC, which is, I think, in Tennessee somewhere. There's a museum of ARC. They build up ARC according to these dimensions. Huge things. Would Noah fit all the animals on the Earth in that ARC? Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? See, my question would be, I have, I have only one question when I think about those things, when I, when I read that. You know, once those animals get on that ark, okay, who cleans the bottom of that ark? <laughs> See, that's how I think, okay? <laughs> yeah, imagine that work. Because you have all those animals, and they eat, and they poop. Where does it go? Ark has only one opening, you know, one, one window. Either it's you know, difficult work for Noah and his sons, or there is some other way of doing it. It doesn't matter. You know, the Bible is not interested in that. The Bible tells us a story, a story that teaches us, as again, that God had to destroy the earth by flood, because again, chaos, chaos is destroyed by chaos, but God decided to bring this new, let's say, creation out of, let's say, only small remnant small amount of animals and people. This is also very important later on in the history of Israel. Because when Israel goes to exile, God brings back a remnant. God brings and re restores this, the, the, the country, the nation, out of small number of people that were faithful. So here Noah and his family are good, righteous people. They're faithful. They follow God's commands. That's why they bring new creation. Later on, it's going to happen again. So. Again, God made those animals come to Noah. They, again, remember, they still, all the animals are, are vegetarians so still. Okay? They don't eat each other yet. That's only after flood. But as so far, they, they, everybody's vegetarian. Still, it takes a lot of food and a lot of you know, other things there to clean. But what is happening? Uh, it's the construction of this account. Because when you look at the construction of this account, I just, I'm going to tell you, that if I had a board, I would probably, it would be better, but... So what is happening there? When you look at chapter... I'm too far now. Here we go. Chapter 7 and chapter 8. Okay? The Great Flood. So what is happening there? Chapter 7 and chapter 8 are kind of chiasm. It's a literary device that the first part of this, of this, of this uh, construction is, uh, corresponds or is almost the same as the last one. And then the second, fir the fir the second and the second last are also correspond almost the same. And what is the most important thing of the whole account is what's, what's right in the middle. That's why it's like a key, like an X. Okay? So we have things. In this account, when you look at chapter... At chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, one to, verses 1 to 5, actually, you know, verse uh, 9, sorry, 1 to 9, we have seven, number seven, seven days of waiting before the flood starts. When you look at chapter <clears throat> 8, verse 10 to 12, no, sorry, verse 12, just verse 12. It's another seven, seven days of waiting. So here is seven days of waiting for the flood to start, for the rain to come. At the end is seven days of waiting before he let the dove go and the dove don't come back. Then we have another seven, which is verse 10 of chapter 7. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. And we have another seven, verse 10 of chapter 8. He waited another seven days, and he sent forth the dove out of the ark. So this is the first setting. So you have the dove goes out, never comes back. There's the waiting. Here is the rain comes down, and doves comes back. OK? 
Okay, still. Then we have, the, for the rest of the part, verse 17 especially for chapter 7, it's the 40 days of flooding. Right? The flood continues 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased. What corresponds to that? Verse 6 of chapter 8. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and set forth a raven. Why? Because verse 5, God says, and the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. In the 10th month of the first day of the month, the top of the mountains were seen. So this is the 40 days, starts 40 days of waiting before the waters go down. So in first part, the flood, the waters go up. At the very end, the waters go down. Then we have 150 days of chaos which is, again, uh, verse 24 of chapter 7. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. What corresponds to that? Verse 3 of chapter 8. And the waters receded from the earth continually, and at the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. So here was the chaos raging for 150 days. Here we have chaos, you know, calming down for 150 days. What is in the center of all of that? Chapter 8, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the water subsides. God made the wind blow over the water. Remember that from Genesis 1, right? It's against a new creation. God makes the wind, or ruah, or his bread, to blow over the water, and the water goes down. God is in total control. But what is important is the first verse. The first verse, God remembered. It doesn't mean that God forgot Noah and those animals in the ark before. In the Bible, when, when we have hear the expression, God remembered, meaning God is getting into action. God is starting doing something. Up till now, God was waiting. All of a sudden, God said, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work. That's why when we pray, what we say, Remember us, O Lord, meaning God, do something. And that's the same thing, you know, in the Bible, that's always, you know, when you, when you read that God remembered this, or like God remembered Leah when she was childless, and all of a sudden she has a child and so on. When God remembers, meaning God is beginning to act very actively, something is happening. That's why this verse is a central verse to the whole account. It's telling us that in the midst of chaos, distraction, God is in control, and when God decided to act, things will happen. A new creation will happen. Okay? Does it make sense? I know it's a little complicated, but I will try to put that uh, so that you could have some visual thing with that. So we have this. Now, questions about the, about the, the flood. Yes. Eight, it says eight or two? Eight, eight, eight. eight. Ah, eight. One, one yeah. One, Why? No, no. Pure animals are the animals that are being used for sacrifice. Those are the, those are the pure. Those are, uh, let's say, ritually pure. Remember, the Jewish have kashrut, law of kashrut. Certain animals are not clean, like pig, for example. You cannot offer pig on the altar, right? Or some other animals. So the, the, the pure animals are the ones that, are, uh, that you can eat, but also that you can offer sacrifice on. Why Noah needed seven of them? Because what is the first thing that he does when he go, walks out of the ark? He builds an altar, and he slaughters the animals. He offers the sacrifice. So that's the basic, basic thing here. Okay. Yeah, because you're not going to sacrifice them. You can let them go. They will propagate. You know, they will multiply. By themselves, so it's only one one pair of every other animal. Yeah, I was just always only wondering why God saved mosquitoes. You know, it's like. <laughs> well, no, this, this whole idea about we we out of time. We need to finish it, but uh, so we basically up to chapter nine, because you know we're not going to go in in details through chapter seven and eight because you can just read yourself that yourself and just pay attention to numbers. Because I know you read it at least a couple of times up till now. So read it one more time and just pay attention how the numbers are, are working and what is the importance of it. Because it's, it's always very important that, you know, to, to look at that.
but the numbers, repetitions, and all that. Okay? So we will, uh, again, now maybe I will be able to do the Noah, Babel, Babel, and Abraham. So let's see. Maybe next time, read all the way to chapter 15. So I'm, not, I'm not sure how far we will, we will be able to go, but we'll certainly do more than a couple of chapters. Now, you know, I don't need to go through verse by verse. I think we can just treat the story as itself. I'll just pay, you know, kind of bring your attention into what is, what is important to pay attention to. Okay? Questions? We good? Again, if you have questions, email me, and I promise you I'm going to sit down tomorrow and type the list, and I'm going to send you an email. Because <laughs> I didn't have to time to do that yet. Okay? So let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, you are our Father, and you always take care of us and always protect us in our lives. Help us always to appreciate your presence, and not to do things against your will, but we'll always be able to walk with you. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a good night and a good week. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. God bless you.